Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Suanna Crowley, and I am with the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. I'm your co-host for the day. Um, we are about to get started. We're going to give ourselves a few minutes uh, to let folks come in to our webinar space, and we'll take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, but we welcome you from whatever corner of the world you are joining us from, and we hope that you'll sit down with, with a snack or a beverage and be able to enjoy the wonderful presentation by our speaker today. Again, we'll just get started in another minute or two. My name again is Suanna Crowley with the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Okay, I think a few more people will probably come in uh, to the webinar space and that we'll be able to uh, get ourselves started uh, with our speaker today. So hello and welcome to episode 10 of season five of Digging In, a digital conversation series with archeologists. I'm both honored and a little bit sad to tell you that this is the last episode of the Digging In series. This is the 50th episode, five seasons, uh, begun in the summer of 2020, a pandemic project uh, that was created by our co-host, uh, Lindsay Randall, who is not joining us here today, um, but a project of both the Massachusetts Archaeological Society and the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Alice uh, Prisco, who is treasurer of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Uh, and together we will be welcoming our speaker, Jessica Bowes. Um, I am starting off our little uh, episode today to welcome you, uh, and Alice will close the episode for us. Um, again, my name is Suanna Crowley, and I'm your host for the afternoon. Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored, as I said, by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We like to begin with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute is on, uh, with, uh, within the Phillips Academy uh, school system in Andover. Let me begin by doing the acknowledgement and then we'll proceed with our introductions. The Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Penacook and Pawtucket peoples and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoket, and Nipmuc nations. We honor all indigenous peoples who are here now have been here for time immemorial and will be here in the future. We acknowledge indigenous, indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempt, attempted erasure of indigenous peoples. We commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering native voices and communities and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. Thank you for allowing me to, to do that land acknowledgement. I wanna just pause here by saying that again, this is our very last episode of the Digging In series. I'm proud to let our viewers know, so many of them who have joined us over the last three years, um, that Digging In series is has been a wonderful uh, project for Mass Archaeology and the RSP Buddy, uh, the Massachusetts Archaeological Society YouTube page, which is where this video will be published, has over 7,000 views for the series, with more than 41,000 people finding some version of our Digging In series, with 200, almost 250 subscribers. So we want to stop for a moment and recognize how much wonderful impact this pandemic pivot had for our organizations. And also thank you for being such a wonderful part of that journey. If you enjoy our programming, please consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring this kind of fun and outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. Now, let me turn to introducing our guest speaker today. We are excited to welcome Jessica Bowes. Jessica is the Cultural Resource Specialist for Women's Rights and Harriet Tubman National Par Historical Parks. She has two Masters of Arts degrees in Historical Archaeology and Anthropology and is currently working on a PhD in Archaeology, focusing her research on Harriet Tubman, African-American Archaeology, and Foodways. 
During and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers will be able to submit questions directly through the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will give our speaker, speaker time to answer as many of them as they can without uh, interrupting her primary presentation. Uh, and we ask that you understand that we may not get to all of the wonderful questions. So without further ado, I want to turn our afternoon presentation over to Jessica and welcome her to start uh, her slide presentation and her talk. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, for this sort of bittersweet uh, last episode. So I appreciate being a part of this. Um, just getting my Zoom set up here. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, I, I said, hello everyone, I'm Jessica Bose. Thank you for having me here. Um, and uh, so the talk today is the archeology span of Harriet Tubman in black communities in Auburn, New York. Um, and as stated, I'm a cultural resource specialist for women's rights in Harriet Tubman National Historical Park. Uh, I have a master's degree in historical archeology span from UMass Boston, um, and I'm working on my PhD in anthropology at Syracuse University. My dissertation is on the foodways of Harriet Tubman's household in Auburn, New York, um, but that won't be the focus of my talk today. Rather, I thought I'd give a broad overview of some of the archeological work done um, in the two areas that are now the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park, a relatively new national park, uh, and discuss the potential for other areas of research in the community. So first, a brief overview on Tubman's life and while, why I'll be speaking about her time in Auburn, New York. Harriet Tubman is most famously known for her role as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, receiving the title of Moses of her people and for her work as a spy, scout, and a nurse during the Civil War. However, she spent most of her life over 50 years in Auburn. Harriet Tubman was born in Dorchester County in Maryland in 1822. She was one of nine children, all enslaved as their mother was. In 1849, at 27, year old, 27 years old, Tubman self-emancipated, going first to Philadelphia by way of New Jersey. Tubman quickly finds that she is not content with her freedom alone and wants to bring her family with her. She reflects on this later in her life, telling Sarah Bradford, her biographer, Quote, I was a stranger in a strange land, and my home, after all, was down in Maryland, because my father, my mother, my brothers, and sisters, and friends were there. But I was free, and they should be free. I would make a home in the North and bring them, God helping me. So while Tubman plans her first trip back to Maryland to start retrieving family members, the Fugitive Slave Act is passed in 1850. This means that no northern states, that the northern northern states are no longer safe, and Tubman cannot bring her family to freedom in Philadelphia, but rather needs to bring them into Canada, where their freedom is secured. Over the next decade, Tubman makes 13 trips from Maryland to St. Catharines, Ontario, bringing a known 70 people to freedom. And it is while doing this work, risking her life to bring her family to freedom, that she meets prominent and influential abolitionists, including William Still and Lucretia Mott in Philadelphia. It is through the connections with other abolitionists, specifically influential abolitionist women, that Harriet Tubman comes to purchase a seven-acre farm in central New York in 1859 on the eve of the Civil War. She purchases the home from abolitionist Frances Seward and her husband, New York Senator William Seward, who would become the Secretary of State under Lincoln. The Seward family lived just a couple miles down the road from Tubman's new home and would remain a part of her network. This map shows the extent of Tubman's property at 32 acres, but the first seven acres were below the pink line, technically in neighboring town of Fleming. Often maps of Tubman's property has it falling off the southern edge of the property, but that's because the property straddles the town line dipping into Fleming. When Tubman finally arrives to her home in Auburn following the Civil War, she brings her family with her, her parents, brothers, and their wives and children from Canada. Others from that community in St. Catharines, Ontario will also follow Tubman to Auburn. Tubman will live most of her life in her chosen home of Auburn, becoming a prominent community member, community member as she continues her work as a humanitarian. 
There are two national parks for, for Harriet Tubman, one in Auburn and one in Maryland. The Maryland Park is Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historical Park, and it is a fascinating site, but it won't be discussed here today. The Harriet Tubman National Historical Park in Auburn, New York consists of two locations, Tubman's residence or her farmstead and the historic Thompson AME Zion Church. When the park was established by Congress in 2017, the legislation designated a park partner, Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated. This nonprofit operates the brick residence and property that Harriet Tubman purchased in 1859 and the additional lands and structures she purchased to expand the property in 1895. This site has been open to the public since the 1950s. The National Park Service owns and operates the historic African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, or AME Zion Church, the site of Tubman's funeral, and its associated parsonage on Parker Street in Auburn. You'll hear me say Parker Street quite a bit. This site is set to open the public, hopefully in the fall of 2023. For the discussion today, I will talk about archaeology at both locations, as well as potential research in the greater community. We'll start at Tubman's farmstead at the southern end of Auburn. This map here shows a few different aspects of Tubman's land. First, the red boundary is the extent of the national park for this property. You'll notice that there is a cutout on the bottom left. This land did belong to Tubman, but was parceled off in the 1950s. It is still privately owned and wasn't included in the park boundary, but it was a part of her original seven acres. The map also shows Tubman's property at its greatest size. It becomes 32 acres in 1895, but the first seven acres Tubman buys from the Sewards is the long piece at the bottom. It has a small wooden house on the property, and after the Civil War, she moves her family here to her farmstead. Her neighbor to the north, labeled Farmer Ross Property, runs a brick manufacturing operation on the land, which employed several of Tubman's brothers and her second husband. Tubman acquires this neighbor property in 1895. It's 25 acres, and while there is still a brick-making component, she buys the land with the intent of developing a home for aging African Americans. There was an elderly home in Auburn already at this time, but it was for whites only. In 1903, Tubman deeds this 25 acres to the AME Zion Church, who work with her to open John Brown Hall Home for the Aged in 1908. This is labeled east of center on the map and is the structure among the circles representing an orchard. Tubman will become a patient in John Brown Hall Home for the Aged in 1911, and it's where she dies in 1913. After Tubman's death, her original seven acre, acres was bequeathed to her nieces with the instruction they sell the property. The 25 acres continued to be owned by the AME Zion Church, and they operate, and they operate the Home for the Aged for another decade. In the 1930s, the church started operating the site, or Pardon. In the 1950s, the church started operating the site as a museum and memorial to Harriet Tubman, modifying a wooden structure to be a small house museum and apartment for the site manager. You can see some of the later features added to the site, including a parking lot, pond, and additional museum and uh, administrative buildings. The Amy Zion Church still owns the property to this day and manages the site through the nonprofit Harriet Tubman Home Inc., the Legislated Park Partner. Most of the original property was reunited with the 25 acres in the late 90s when it was purchased by the AME Zion Church. The archaeology of Tubman's property in Auburn has been the decades-long work of Dr. Doug Armstrong at Syracuse University, which began with a fortuitous visit in the, to the site in 1994. Dr. Armstrong recently published his work, and we can draw on this to understand some of the different archaeological sites on Tubman's 32 acres. Some of that work is captured here on this map with the brown dots representing archaeological excavation units over the last few decades. This is just an overview, but I'll discuss each of the main areas before discussing other sites in the community. I won't go into depth on site methodology or a deep dive into the findings, but all of that is included in Dr. Armstrong's book. Rather, I will give a more general overview of some of the more interesting finds for each area and how the archaeology helped uncover lesser known histories of Tubman's life in, uh, in freedom. So first we'll start with Tubman's home, her first purchase in central New York. I mentioned that when she purchased the land in 1859, there was a wood framed house on the property. This was the case until 1880 when the structure burned and it was rebuilt in 1882 as a two story brick structure pictured here. The bottom picture is recent with the porches and windows, but the porches and windows are restorations from 2015. 
Archaeological work around her residence in the early to mid 2000s recovered objects related to the Tubman household and their life on this property. An original brick walkway was revealed in the front of the house, and it was the archaeology that revealed the history of the burned home. Local lore says that the general community forgot that the brick residence was Tubman's home. Remember, it was left to her nieces who then had to sell it into private hands. Rather, a wood structure on the 25 acres, the neighboring property became thought of as her residence, rather than the memorial created by the Amy Zion Church, since it was known that Tubman purchased a wooden home from the Sewards. Dr. Armstrong and, a, and field school students uh, uh, from Syracuse University uncovered an ash layer around the building, the brick residence, that contained significant quantities of building materials and burned ceramic, including, or burn materials, including nails, glass, and ceramic. The archaeology narrowed the date of the possible burn to 1880 to 1882, helping narrow the historical document search for further evidence. Eventually, several articles were found that referenced a fire on February 10, 1880, that started at around two in the morning and quickly consumed the whole building. The articles note Tubman as the property owner and finally account for what happened to the original wood structure on the property. Additional restoration plans for the home prompted further investigations, including removing the 1920s porches, which you can see in the top left photo. The porches preserved archeological deposits related to Tubman's household and the fire, and the excavations beneath the porches proved to be some of the richest archeology span on the site, yielding thousands of artifacts. They included plain uh, ironstone serving dishes and plates, spoons and bone handled knives and forks, stemware and decorations like bud vases and figurines. This area also yielded objects of personal endowment, including several six pointed star buttons. These buttons were used in the painting of Tubman that was to be the basis for the engraving for the $20 bill. And you can see them um, on her above the name Tubman on the, in the mock up here. And before anyone asks a question on the status of the $20 bill, I do not have any insider knowledge and I do not, and I do not know anything about the future of the 20. Sorry. <laughs> Excavations in other areas around her residence, including a well and possible garden and chicken coop became the basis for my dissertation topic on the foodways of the Tubman household. Animal bone with butcher marks were recovered around the property for years, but there hadn't been any intentional soil sampling for plant remains. Uh, until I joined the project in 2012. For three years, I collected samples and worked with Syracuse University undergraduates to help gather data pictured here. That research is still ongoing, so I won't speak to conclusions related to food waste here, nor do we have the time. So next we're moving north to, uh, in her property into the 25 acres. So the white structure at the bottom is on the 25 acres to the north of Tubman's seven acre farm. The picture you see here is modern and that is the site that was uh, restored in the 1950s to be a sort of memorial to Harriet Tubman. And it's one of the structures, if you visit the site that you can um, go inside today. But it, the structure itself is originally from about 1855 and likely housed brick makers while the property was uh, owned by the brick, was still a brick manufacturing site prior to Tubman's ownership. The main brick kilns and borrow pits are just east of the structure. The original wood frame house would have had a two room kitchen off to the east. <laughs> After Tubman's ownership, this building continued to be rented and it was included in the deed transfer to the AME Zion Church. After her death, the home for the aged was moved from John Brown Hall to this building until the 1930s, when eventually the home for the aged was finally closed. The building was abandoned and fell into, fell into disrepair until the 1950s when historic preservation fundraising and grants allowed for the current rehabilitation as a memorial museum for the site by the AME Zion Church. The image on the right is of the brick manufacturing area. Natural clay deposits in the region made brick manufacturing a common addition to farmsteads. The bricks from these kilns, as well as other local kilns, were used to investigate where the brick came from and used where were used to investigate where the brick came from used to rebuild Tubman's home after the fire. The brick from several local kilns and samples from her home underwent neutron activation analysis. It could not be determined if the brick on Tubman's 1882 home came from this kiln as all the local potters tested yielded very similar compositions. However, it did confirm that the brick used on Tubman's residence was local brick. 
The final area on Tubman's property that I will discuss is John Brown Hall, home for the aged. This structure was originally a dormitory for brick workers prior to Tubman's ownership. When Tubman purchased the property, she started fundraising for the rehabilitation of this structure. It wasn't until the Amy Zion Church took over ownership that the structure was outfitted as a home for aging Black Americans and nurses. John Brown Hall opened in 1908, and Tubman herself was infirmed there in 1911, and it's where she died in 1913 at 91 years old. The image shows Tubman and some of the other residents, nurses, and managers for the home in front of the structure. By the late 1940s, the building was crumbling and ultimately condemned and torn down. The ruins of this structure was the first site excavated on the property by Armstrong. The story, according to Doug Armstrong, is that he brought an archaeology class to the site for a visit. He saw this image in the museum and asked the site manager where the building was. The site manager, Reverend Paul Carter, who is still the site manager for Harriet Tubman Home, wasn't exactly sure but knew it was back in the woods. The exact location of, of the structure lost to the secessional woods that developed in the second half of the 20th century. Doug told his students that they had to find evidence of the structure to earn their lunch that day, and apparently it only took 15 minutes. Excavations were conducted in 1997 and 1998 and revealed the layout of the brick structure. And artifacts were those typical of an infirmary with large quantities of pharmaceutical bottles, storage and canning jars, plates and bowls, and the heart-shaped pill box pictured here. Now we'll move from Tubman's property at the southern edge of the city of Auburn to the historic Thompson Church on Parker Street. You might be wondering, why was the church included in the National Park designation and in our conversation on archaeology related to Tubman? When Tubman arrived in Auburn, she entered a city with an established Black community. As early as 1820, African Americans settled the Owasco River outlet on the eastern side of the city, the area labeled as New Guinea on an 1834 map of Auburn. By 1850, the city's Black community moved north to Washington Street near the new African American school and new AME Zion Church. The home Tubman purchased is south of the city outside of what this map covers. The area where the historic church now stands, the new National Park site, just west of Fort Hill Cemetery in the Yellow Box, were farm fields until the construction of homes on small neighborhood plots in the 1870s. The Amy Zion Church purchased the half acre lot on Parker Street to build a new church in 1891, moving it from Washington Street. Parker Street was starting to be developed prior to the creation of the church. Eight homes were constructed in the 1870s and 1880s and were owned by African Americans, meaning the church was intentionally constructed within an expanding Black community. Many of the neighborhood homes built in the late 19th century are still standing. Six were continuously owned and occupied by African American families from the late 19th century through to the 21st century, and Tubman descendants still live in several of these homes. This map is from a 2005 study on the Freedom Trail in the county where Auburn is located. Over 100 sites associated with connections to the Underground Railroad, abolitionism, and African-American life were documented by the team of researchers. Of those, 66 were in Auburn, the purple dots on this map, and there are likely others. The yellow box in the center is Fort Hill Cemetery, just to better orient you to the map. This growth and geographical shift in the African-American community follows Tubman's presence and influence, though I don't intend to suggest she created this community. But we can see her influence as several of the homes outlined in green here were owned by Tubman's family members or individuals she helped bring to freedom. Even today, some of the homes are still owned by Tubman descendants, as I mentioned. Further, Tubman utilized her network to fundraise on behalf of the Parker Street Church over the last two decades of her life, so the church itself adds another space that Tub Tubman heavily influenced. The church, pictured here with the parsonage uh, to its right, was constructed in 1891, 32 years after Tubman arrived in Auburn, and the parsonage was constructed in 1910. The man in this photo is standing on a wooden walkway crossing a culvert just outside the front door of the church, being supported by a um, curbstone. The church was well situated with walkable access to Fort Hill Cemetery where Tubman is buried. 
This access was used on the day of Tubman's funeral and interment. Her casket was carried out the front door of the church, across the culvert and curbstone, across Parker Street and the open lots to her resting place in Fort Hill Cemetery. Tubman died of pneumonia on March 10, 1913 at John Brown Hall. Her services at the AME Zion Church three days later on March 13th drew in hundreds to pay their respects. The images here of her funeral shows the exit from the church and her internment at Fort Hill. The photo of the casket leaving the church just above the col just of leaving the church is just above the culvert that the man from the earlier image was standing on. Research on the church and parsonage started in 2018 after the park was designated. Research included several years of developing a historic structures report, a cultural landscape report, and an archaeolog and archaeological testing related to later utility work for the restoration and rehabilitation of the buildings. In 2019, this testing revealed that the curbstone evident in the historic photos as supporting the walkway across the culvert is still intact. The photo on the left is taken at the same advantage at the same vantage point as the photo of Tubbins casket leaving the church. And these, these are still in place uh, today and it's hoped that the park will be able to uh, interpret these when it's open to the public. Excavations have revealed areas related to the construction of the church, like the limestone used in the foundation of the church on the left. Artifacts include ceramics linked to the community use of the church from its beginnings in the 1890s through more modern times. The church was still in use until the early 2000s, evidenced by the ring pop ring recovered from excavations. That's that yellow circle kind of in the center there. Archaeology at the historic church and parsonage is still ongoing as it relates to the restoration and rehabilitation of the structures. And artifacts from excavations this past summer are still waiting analysis with more excavations for the church and parsonage site planned for the spring of 2023. Harriet Tubman from the southern edge of the city would have walked the neighborhoods north of her home regularly. The sites highlighted on this map show just some of Tubman's greater community, including several family members who had settled in Auburn by 1871. It also highlights the first local AME Zion Church on Washington Street, the Presbyterian Church where she married her second husband, the home of the Sewards, and the future site of the AME Zion Church, which hosted her funeral in 1913. This map, though, is not comprehensive as Tubman was ingrained in the community in Auburn. In her book, The Geography of Resistance, Cheryl LaRoche states that the pillars of, Black, of the Black Underground Railroad movement are family, church, and community. It's easy to see how these pillars of the quest for freedom that were integral to the success of freedom seekers are then mapped onto the Black community in Auburn following emancipation. The archaeology of Tubman in Auburn has been centered on her farmstead. It is just recently that it has expanded to neighboring relevant sites with the excavation of the historic Thompson AME Zion Church on Parker Street. But there is a wealth of opportunity and need for research as it relates to the greater Black community. Uh, the greater Black community Tubman helped move, Tubman moved into and helped expand. While it is true that much of the integrity of Parker Street and the greater neighborhood is still intact, this may not always be the case. Urban landscapes are often the site of frequent change over time due to development and fast changing needs of a city, particularly during times of population growth. We are fortunate that these residents, residential areas of Auburn were able to escape urban renewal of the 1950s, but this may not always be true as external threats are always at play. For instance, private homeowners may not have the ability, resources, or desire to continue to preserve these sites. So the decades of Tubman's farmstead, the decades of archaeology at Tubman's farmstead has yielded a wealth of knowledge for understanding Tubman and her family and her family's life and freedom. Future research could further this knowledge about the history of the community in Auburn and is a unique opportunity to explore a community that helped shape and was shaped by Harriet Tubman. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was wonderful. It was it's amazing to think that, you know, everything we know or we think we know about Harriet Tubman, she's such a prominent figure, and yet they're constantly finding things out like, oh, wait, that wasn't actually the right house. Uh <laughs> yes, yes. And, and actually that um, sort of um, 
that that myth still persists persists today where people uh, misunderstand which building she actually lived in. Yeah. <laughs> Still an issue. Or they came to the site and they say, you know, oh, I came here in second grade and they told us it was the white building, you know, and a lot of, yes. a lot of unlearning too. <laughs> we get a lot of that in Massachusetts as well. Um, so we did have a question in the question and answer. We had a few. Um, one of the first questions that we had was um, with next year going forward and the planned archaeology, uh, is there any opportunity for volunteers from the public aspect of it or is it just for the National Park Service employees and staff? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there is, is always an opportunity for volunteers uh, with National Park sites and the archaeology. The archaeology is still getting, um, we're still in the planning phases for it and it's related to um, more utility work to get the church and parsonage up and running. Um, but a great way would be to uh, contact me and I can see if there's an opportunity there to have some volunteers on site while we do that or at some part of the process. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so if you, um, Linda was the one who asked that question. So Linda, just let us know and we can connect you with Jessica. Um, and then we also had a question. So you had mentioned that um, at the Brown Hall for the Aged, it was predominantly medicine related type artifacts found. Was there anything that was surprising that was found that was a little out of place? There were items. Um, some of the items recovered were uh, like kind of arts and crafts. I don't think that that is so surprising. It kind of speaks to kind of those daily activities of people kind of keeping busy. Um, but there were uh, toys found that suggests or could be interpreted as suggesting a presence of children. Um, and, you know, when I give people the tours of, um, of the site or when I'm out there talking to folks, I always talk about how it's kind of a bustling environment. You know, in Tubman's home, she brings in her her two aging parents, her brothers, their wives and kids, and they're in all in that one structure together for quite a long time until her brothers start settling out in Auburn. And then even after they leave, um, she she always opens her home to people in need. So there's there's constantly a lot of people there and children being one of them. So I think if you were to look at the archaeology of John Brown Hall without that greater context and you saw these toys and this presence of kids, you know, it'd be kind of create a little interesting, huh, I wonder what's going on there. But I think when you zoom out and look at Tubbins property and just the reality of how many people are, are coming and going even for short stays, um, it probably tracks that would have, would have been children either on the site back there, maybe they were related to the managers who helped run it or the nurses or even some of the patients themselves. So. Uh, but I think what you know, finding those standalone objects, I think there was a, a baby doll carriage um, and a few other items, but so those could could be initially puzzling. <laughs> it's always interesting to think of context for those types of things. Yeah. Right. Uh, and someone also, we had another question. This question is from Al. What type of archaeological geophysics are you using to identify anomalies uh, for further yeah. investigation? Yep, so there was some um, geophysical studies done, I want to say in the early 2000s, um, some G and, and actually most recently in 2019, we brought a GPR out um, cool. to, to survey an area that had been previously excavated and didn't yield very much. And, and before we want, there were, there are not plans to go poking around too much more archaeologically, but um, I haven't seen the, the results from that data yet, though. Um, I haven't been looped in, but um, I believe there's some magnetometry done, GPR, and um, that's what I have off the top of my head. I know Doug talks about more of it in his in his book, though. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Um, and then I guess another question too that we had was, what what is your favorite aspect? What is not the most surprising per se, but what uh, artifact or what discovery made on the property? really has been your favorite to uncover so far? Yeah, so my, this is easy. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I, I love this site and um, I started doing the archeology span on that site, this site before I started working for the National Park Service. And actually I started with the National Park Service at Fort Stanwyck's National Monument in Rome, New York. Um, and I actually only started working for Harriet Tubman and women's rights in April of this year. So I, I've had a long history with Tubman that predates my national park career. And uh, I think what 
has always had me so attached to this site and where I, I get, get big feels when I think about <laughs> doing archaeology and the privilege of doing archaeology um, related to Tubbin and her household is the um, the engaging with Tubman as a real person versus a myth, right? So Tubman is this larger than life character when we think about her um, and her family. And, and she did it, these incredible things for our society and these incredible feats. Um, but when you're excavating her site and you're pulling out broken dishes, you know, that's really relatable. And, um, <laughs> you know, she, she, her household, you know, there are certain folks who who come out of even just her same county in Maryland, like Frederick Douglass. He's also from Dorchester County, who sort of make a name for themselves and see sort of financial results from that. You know, he becomes quite wealthy. That never happens for Tubman. Um, and, and there are different discussions to be had about that. One, she's a woman. Another one, she's technically illiterate. She, you know, she doesn't read or write. Not that that takes away from the other literacies she definitely does have. But um, so does that hurt her ability to become stable? But she's actually always struggling financially. Uh, and a lot of the material goods that come into her home are being gifted by supporters of hers in the community and, and to help her take on her philanthropic work to help her support her, the elderly folks that she has coming into her home or really anyone in need and do this work. And so, um, you know, when, when you're excavating the site or when you're, even when you visit, if anyone has a chance to visit, I recommend it. But when you're engaging with these things, you're, it's really humbling to recognize Tubman and her family. This was a lot of people in there using these materials that we find archeologically for the everyday people with the everyday struggles that many of us can relate to in some ways um, at different parts of it. You know, maybe you don't relate to Tubman as the whole big picture, but there are these elements. Um, and that is my favorite part. So it's, it's not an object or, or necessarily a moment, but it's also the thing I'm most grateful to be able to do at the park and, and why I love telling, um, sharing the stories of the archeology span there is to sort of you know, she's mythic for a reason and that's good, but also to humanize her and make her relatable in other ways. And I would almost argue that, you know, removing the myth and making her more human, as you say, it makes her more impressive because you look at somebody, like you said, who was struggling and still she found all this time to help others and do so much for the community and really give of herself and her family gave of themselves. And so it definitely, you know, in my mind, adds a little bit to the mythology of what a wonderful person uh, she really was. So that's, that's very true and very great. So thank you Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. And I always, I always, when, when I have kids on the site, uh, well, I try to do two things. One, I try to make them value education, pointing out that, <laughs> you know, Tubman was not allowed to learn to read or write, um, but she still did great things. And um, to see if they can find one thing about Tubman's story that they can relate to and carry forward because she is human and there are relatable elements. And so if it's, you know, helping a friend or a family member. That's always what, what I try to do. And I think it's it's an important part of her story. Yes, it's so true. It's so funny to, to relate it, especially to children. <laughs> so awesome. Does anybody else have any questions for Jessica in the chat? Um, you can put them in the QA. You can send them directly to me. Or if you can sort of raise your hand, I can um, let you talk live. Is there anything else? I mean, she did a fantastic job going through. So I can't think of any questions myself. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't seem so. I'll just wait another second in case someone's typing, letting it brew. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Jessica, so much for your time today. It was an amazing, informative talk. And oh, um, we've got some thank yous. Someone did ask, what are the National Park Service plans moving forward? Um, I'm assuming with this site specifically. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, for the church and parsonage, we're hoping to open that to visitors in the fall of 2023. The buildings are undergoing restoration and rehabilitation um, now. And, you know, I think theoretically they're supposed to be done by March, but you got to add a little time for all the delays that happen in big construction. Um, and then our partner site, the Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated, is open to the public. Um, you can visit that site, you know, you check their website for hours. That's run by, by our partners. Um, 
And at the same time, the, the park does a lot with the local community. Auburn is lucky to host the, um, the have the Equal Rights Heritage Center there with a the beautiful um, exhibits inside. And uh, we work with them quite closely giving walking tours of the town. We work closely with the Seward House as well. So the park is, um, even though the building, the structures of the church and parsonage aren't open, the park has a presence throughout the community. Um, and uh, so hopefully if folks can come out and visit, even if you, you come out before the, the church and parsonage are open, there's a lot to do in the area related to Tubman and the park service. Awesome. I'm going over to Wiggins Rights, which is only 20 <laughs> minutes away. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about us. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got some a lot of thank yous in the chat and in the question and answer. Everybody wanted you to know that that was wonderful. They really enjoyed it. Um, it was such an honor to have you as sort of our, our last speaker for the official Digging In series. Uh, we really want to thank you for your time. Thank you for all the contributions you do. I personally am a national park nerd, so this speaks to my heart, uh, <laughs> my husband's as well. But um, yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, we're definitely gonna be doing something like this next year. It won't be necessarily this format, but if you have any questions, reach out to the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. If you have any questions for Jessica, please feel free to reach out to us as well and we can kind of shuttle those over to her. Um, otherwise, I want to thank everybody for their time and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.